The Island of Dr. Moreau Written by H.G. Wells Read by Ed French Chapter 1 In the Dinghy of the Lady Vane I do not propose to add anything to what has already been written concerning the loss of the Lady Vane. As everyone knows, she collided with a derelict when ten days out from Kaleo. The longboat with seven of the crew was picked up eighteen days after by Her Majesty's gunboat Myrtle, and the story of their privations has become almost as well known as the far more terrible Medusa case. I have now, however, to add to the published story of the Lady Vane another as horrible and certainly far stranger. It has hitherto been supposed that the four men who were in the dinghy perished, but this is incorrect. I have the best evidence for this assertion. I am one of the four men. But, in the first place, I must state that there never were four men in the dinghy. The number was three. Constanz, who was, quote, seen by the captain to jump into the gig, Daily News, March 17, 1887, luckily for us, and unluckily for himself, did not reach us. He came down out of the tangle of ropes under the stays of the smashed bowsprit. Some small rope caught his heel as he let go, and he hung for a moment, head downward, and then fell and struck a block or spar floating in the water. We pulled towards him, but he never came up. I say, luckily for us, he did not reach us, and I might almost add, luckily for himself, for there were only a small breaker of water and some sodden ship's biscuits with us. So sudden had been the alarm, so unprepared the ship for any disaster. We thought the launch would be better provisioned, though it seems they were not, and we tried to hail them. They could not have heard us, and the next morning when the drizzle cleared, which was not till past midday, we could see nothing of them. We could not stand up to look about us because of the pitching of the boat. The sea ran in great rollers, and we had much ado to keep the boat's head to them. The two other men who had escaped so far with me were a man named Helmar, a passenger like myself, and a seaman, whose name I don't know, a short, sturdy man with a stammer. We drifted, famishing, and after our water came to an end, tormented by an intolerable thirst, for eight days altogether. After the second day, the sea subsided slowly to a glassy calm. It is quite impossible for the ordinary reader to imagine those eight days. He has not, luckily for himself, anything in his memory to imagine with. After the first day, we said little to one another and lay in our places in the boat and stared at the horizon or watched, with eyes that grew larger and more haggard every day, the misery and weakness gaining upon our companions. The sun became pitiless. The water ended on the fourth day, and we were already thinking strange things and saying them with our eyes. But it was, I think, the sixth before Helmar gave voice to the thing we all had in mind. I remember our voices, dry and thin, so that we bent towards one another and spared our words. I stood out against it with all my might, was rather for scuttling the boat and perishing together among the sharks that followed us. But when Helmar said that if his proposal was accepted we should have drink, the sailor came round to him. I would not draw lots, however, and in the night the sailor whispered to Helmar again and again, and I sat in the bows with my clasp-knife in my hand, though I doubt if I had the stuff in me to fight. And in the morning I agreed to Helmar's proposal, and we handed halfpence to find the odd man. The lot fell upon the sailor, but he was the strongest of us and would not abide by it, and attacked Helmar with his hands. They grappled together and almost stood up. I crawled along the boat to them, intending to help Helmar by grasping the sailor's leg. But the sailor stumbled with the swaying of the boat, and the two fell upon the gunwale and rolled overboard together. They sank like stones. I remember laughing at that and wondering why I laughed. The laugh caught me suddenly like a thing from without. I lay across one of the thwarts for I don't know how long, thinking that if I had the strength I would drink seawater and madden myself to die quickly. And even as I lay there, I saw, with no more interest than if it had been a picture, a sail come up towards me over the skyline. My mind must have been wandering, and yet I remember all that happened quite distinctly. I remember how my head swayed with the seas and the horizon with the sail above it danced up and down. 
but I also remember as distinctly that I had a persuasion that I was dead, and that I thought what a jest it was they should come too late by such a little to catch me in my body. For an endless period, it seemed to me, I lay with my head on the thwart watching the dancing schooner. She was a little ship, schooner rigged fore and aft, come up out of the sea. She kept tacking to and fro in a widening compass, for she was sailing dead into the wind. It never entered my head to attempt to attract attention, and I do not remember anything distinctly after the sight of her side until I found myself in a little cabin aft. There's a dim half-memory of being lifted up to the gangway, and of a big red countenance covered with freckles and surrounded with red hair staring at me over the bulwarks. I also had a disconnected impression of a dark face with extraordinary eyes close to mine, but that, I thought, was a nightmare until I met it again. I fancy I recollect some stuff being poured in between my teeth, and that is all.